Back when the release date for Kerbal Space Program 2 Early Access was announced back in October last year, I was contacted by Private Division, inviting me to a very special event that you're all now probably familiar with. Yes, on the 7th of February, I said goodbye to my gaming PC, my lovely, lovely cat, and I guess my girlfriend, and headed off to the train station. I then got on a train headed towards Bristol, passing by some rather lovely English countryside, and then some even more lovely English seaside. Before arriving at Bristol, hopping on a bus that took me to Bristol Airport Hotel, where I spent the night before getting up ludicrously early for a flight bound for Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Once landed, I boarded a car and checked in at my hotel, and the very next day you all know the story. Me and some other creators that you may know, as well as some journalists and game reviewers, took the bus to the European Space Agency's STEC facility, where we got to check out some pretty nifty things, including these rocket model replicas, this Orion model, a model of the upcoming Rosalind Franklin, previously known as the ExoMars rover, a replica of the ESA Columbus International Space Station module featuring Valentina Kerman, I was even asked to sign stuff like an actual real celebrity or something, and a whole bunch of other stuff that I I barely have time to mention, and uh, yeah. Oh, and also I got to play KSP2! <laughs> I mean, you should all have hopefully seen some of my videos of KSP2 at this point. If you haven't, then check the link in the description. Anyway, where am I going with all of this? Well, first, I captured a lot of video footage and now I feel like I need to justify it, hence that rather drawn out intro. But also, the day after the ESA KSP2 event, I got the chance to sit down with Kerbal Space Program creative director Nate Simpson, as well as senior designer Chris Adderley, to ask some questions about the game. Now, I only had 20 minutes to ask my question, so I didn't manage to rattle through everything that I wanted to ask, but I think that I managed to cover a good amount of ground regardless, so enjoy. And apologies, my plane ticket only allowed for hand luggage, so I couldn't bring my awesome DSLR camera, only a GoPro, which, as it turns out, didn't really like the lighting situation in the interview room. So I'll probably splice some KSP2 footage about here and there, and okay, I've talked too much, let's just do this. Talk amongst yourself. Is the hair, hair a good spot to sit? Oh. Hello, would you like to both introduce yourselves to the camera for anyone that might not know? Yeah, I'm Chris Adderley, I'm a senior systems designer on KSP2. I'm Nate Simpson, creative director for KSP2. And I'm Matt Lown, YouTuber you may know. <laughs> So I think one of the most intriguing aspects of development that a lot of people want to know about is multiplayer. And I think one of the more difficult aspects of Kerbal Space Program would be how managing time warp in multiplayer. Can you share anything about how time warp would work in multiplayer if it's possible? Or? Here's what I can tell you about multiplayer. So first of all, you'll actually see some of the seeds of the multiplayer experience in place even on day one of early access. For example, the concept of an agency. When you begin the game, you get to name an agency, pick a flag, pick your, your colors for your agency. Um, and then at KSC, you now have four launch pads. The reason there are four launch pads is that there will be this notion of an agency being based at a specific launch location. So on Kerbin, we expect to see four separate launch, loca launch locations around the equator, roughly equidistant from one another. Uh, so each there will be an agency located at each of those locations, four players per agency, with four agencies. And the idea is that when you're playing alongside other people within an agency, you are pooling your resources, you're pooling your science payouts as you begin to explore. Um, I'm kind of just looking forward to launching at the same time as all my buddies and watching all our rockets go up. Um, we expect that multiplayer will probably be played different ways by different people. Uh, there is this sort of um, asynchronous play that we expect a lot of people to do. I think that's maybe the one that I'm most excited about. This notion of, let's say, uh, when colonies exist, um, potentially I can I can develop my colony, increase its ability to, uh, let's say, synthesize some local resource using a factory of some kind, and then set up an automated delivery route from my colony to Chris's colony while he's asleep. And then he comes back and he sees that he's getting regular de deliveries of HE3, and he now has a new capability when he's building vehicles at his colony. So I think a lot of these systems kind of build on top of one another. For the time warp thing, um, we have a good solution, but I am not going to talk about it yet because uh, we want to kind of unveil that as part of its own big beat. So what you just described so far is quite a collaborative side of multiplayer. Would right. it be a possible potential for a more competitive 
Right, so, so the most exciting, or to me, one of the more exciting things about it is agencies can be uh, allied with one another or they can be competing with one another. And essentially, you've got the makings of a space race at that point, right? And, and again, the, the thought of arriving at a new celestial body, like arriving at Duna for the first time and seeing the lights of a colony there before you've gotten there, it, it's, I'm so excited about that. I, I'm sure there are some... Uh, it's ripe for griefing possibilities, and I assume people will be <laughs> tormenting one another, but I think the thing that I'm most excited about is the kind of friendly competition. And again, um, it, it, there, there can be a concurrent play experience, right, where, you know, like, let's say car races is a thing that becomes possible, right, where it's just about that kind of real-time interaction. Um, but then there is also the, the fun of seeing other people advancing their civilizational goals and, and sort of the way that that interacts with your own campaign. Very exciting. Can you shed any light onto what the new uh, Monarch Easter egg in KSP1 means, if it means anything? <laughs> no, what is... what's that about? What's going on? Is there something up with the Monarch? There's a Monarch? Well, we, we acknowledge there's a Monarch. We, that, yeah, that's it's, a, it's just a rock. Yeah, it's a rock. Right? Yeah, I know. Is something wrong with the rocks? Please tell me. Please tell me. <laughs> On the subject of Easter eggs though, will there be any Easter eggs from KSP1 that will be returning for KSP2, given that the original, well, the starting server system is going to be the same as in KSP1? You will have to explore to find out the answer to that question. Okay. Continuing with Easter eggs. <laughs> in the kind of, I guess, early phases of KSP1, there was going to be a story as such, which you could kind of piece together by linking together the Easter eggs, to kind of put together this narrative about an old civilization. Any plans for anything like that in KSP2, like some sort of underlying story? I have no comment. So the official roadmap doesn't include any dates or timescales or anything. And I think one thing I think a lot of people will miss initially will be things like science, which I know is the first hurdle on the roadmap. Do you have any sort of ideas about how long it's going to be between each step in the roadmap? Like will we get the first update in the first or second quarter of the year? or? Um, well, first of all, my uh, track record for predicting dates for things <laughs> is uh, a spotty at best. Um, but also, I think because a major component of the future development of the project is the feedback that we receive from the community uh, on day one of early access, um, uh, to some extent, the future is not yet predetermined, right? What our relative priorities are and what we choose to, to focus our production capacity on is heavily contingent on what people are excited about and what they want to see developed first. So um, there's going to be a little bit of a give and take and a, and a process around communicating what people want. Um, and, and then we'll be able to give you a little more solidity about what timetables look like. But we do expect there to be, I mean, I, the one thing I can commit to uh, with a very high degree of certainty is that there will be updates before the science update uh, that are correcting you know, high priority issues that people are encountering on day one. We do expect when this product comes into contact with thousands of people playing in a lot of different ways um, that, that we will discover things that need to be addressed more aggressively uh, and, and there should be updates on the weeks, not months, mm -hmm. time scale. Perfect. When KSP2 was announced many years ago in 2019, <laughs> um, it was obviously promised to feature a lot of things like interstellar, colonies, multiplayer, um, which are now not going to be available when it initially releases into early access. Out of all of those sort of features that are new to KSP2 that weren't in KSP1, which of them kind of pains you the most to not be in the first release of KSP2? Uh, which pains me the most. So I, I don't think I would describe it as pain necessarily. Um, I mean, obviously, if I could magically snap my fingers and have everything we ever wanted be present on day one, that would be lovely. The, the, the most important pillar of KSP2, in fact, the reason that it exists at all, in my opinion, was uh, the goal of bringing more people into the experience. Um, and that is to say, preserving what is fun and awesome about the original Kerbal Space Program and maintaining the challenges, the physics that are at the center of the game, but creating a new ramp, a new experience into that, uh, into that game. Um, and uh, based on our, you know, sort of the first impressions we're hearing from people, we have succeeded gloriously in overhauling the first time user experience and in making the, uh, the interface smoother, more interactable, more communicative to the player, um, very, very happy that that appears to be a successful campaign. So feature number one, I'm feeling very, very good about. Um, 
personally, and you may have a different uh, answer to this than me, the, the specific pillar to which I'm looking the forward the most is colonies. Um, I'm very, very excited about colony gameplay, resource collection, and automated delivery routes. I think the game is going to completely change once that comes online, and there will be a lot more in the way of extrinsic goals, right? Now I'm not just exploring for science's sake, now there's a little bit of like, also if I go to that celestial body over there, there's some resource on it that, that then unlocks a new capability for me. It taps into my material interests in a way that the, the more kind of abstract mission goals don't. Um, that's very exciting to me. I can't wait to be able to do that. Because obviously it sounds like the colonies then and resource gathering are quite intrinsically linked. But yes. they're both in different stages That's right. on the roadmap. That's I think right. the resource gathering comes a couple of stages after colonies are implemented. That is correct. So we're, we're going to get the basic colony construction mechanics and colony just sort of like maintaining and being able to... It's interesting actually, right? Because a colony is still a rigid body array. It's still a physical object that follows the same rules as a, a spacecraft does. But it's in a, a much less dynamic physics regime, and especially on low gravity bodies or in, in, in orbit. You're not really worried too much about the physical implications of the choices you're making. But uh, one thing we've been discovering is that there, even with like something like uh, procedural wings or part coloring, the degree to which you can personalize your creations in KSP2 is, is uh, also very important to the player experience, right? Like when I'm, when I'm building out my colony, I want to make a... I, I, you've, you've seen some pictures actually of colonies that I've built where like I love to make a runway, a little ski ramp at the end to sort of like, uh, you know, uh, to help with uh, slow takeoffs or things like that. Like there is a lot of fun to be had just in terms of the, the Lego like gameplay of colony building. So we want to go ahead and get that unblocked because it's just fun. It's great to find a spot in the new, the new PQS terrain system resulted a lot more local variation. There are a lot of non-repeatable landforms that you come across and I want to make a, a, a colony on the top of one of Ike's volcanoes. Like I want to, there's just so many spots that I want to make a cool, a cool base at. I don't know, I, what, what, is, what are you most looking forward to? Well, it's colonies too, for much, much the same reasons, but also because I just like really like building things in Kerbal, and that's a whole new set of building challenges and, you know, aesthetically cool things. I'm not so much into runways as Nate is, but like, you know, <laughs> roads, like, you know, you make a ring road or the bridge, and then there's like, you know, mining facility over here, and there's like a tube. I don't know, <laughs> it'll be sweet. <laughs> yeah. Because you mentioned obviously about picking places for the base yeah. in KSP-1. Aside from a couple of outliers like the Drez Canyon, typically the planets are just sort of very barren and featureless. I know Breaking Ground added a bit with like the odd little like Giza or Geyser on um, Leif, I think it is. Um, but for the most part, it's still kind of bland and featureless. Are there going to be like big geological features in KSP-2, like ravines and caves and yes. things like well, that? So caves are a completely different animal because our, our terrain system is based functionally on height maps. Hype maps do not like working with caves. Uh, now, that doesn't, that's not to say that in the future we can, could not do static mesh-based caves where we build the upper part of a cave out of geometry that sits on top of a divot in the ground. But that would, if we were to do something like that, it would need to serve some specific gameplay goal. It would need to increase the fun in some interesting way. And I, I totally would not rule that out as something we might attempt to do in the future. Um, but, uh, so one really interesting new component of the terrain system, we have a decal system. We actually, I don't think we've ever talked about this publicly, but you know, for, for specific landforms, like a, a mountain of interest, let's just say the tallest mountain on Eve, right? Is an example of a, a, a bespoke landform that is decal based, that has a slightly higher degree of detail. It's a little bit more bespoke from the art perspective. In the case of that mountain, it's, it, we, we actually set everything up so that it, it peaks just a little bit. It's the only point on Eve that peaks just a little bit above the cloud layer. And so when you're at the top, you're, you're seeing a sea of cloud in front of you. So I, that kind of stuff is just that you, we're creating these like really special moments that like when you see it, you're I, I need to build something here. And of course, top of the mountain on Eve is an ideal colony location. Of course, you're going to build a launch facility there. And then and then maybe run automated resource collection routes down the mountain from that to pick up whatever you want to mine down in the lowlands and bring it back up to the base. And so you have to send me those coordinates for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's so much more interesting terrain variation yeah. and cool new features. And like there's so much 
real geology and real planetary science based things that there's definitely going to be a lot of creative opportunity for cool colony in cool situation and that's going to be really fun. Okay so interstellar obviously quite a big difference in uh, the amount of distance you need to travel between you know going from planet to planet how do you plan on you know um, working with that massive distance involved with interstellar travel? So we had to completely overhaul the way that we handle trajectories. And in fact, the, the technological underpinnings for this game, because, because we had that as a goal, these immense scales and also these continuously accelerating trajectories, uh, that is why the architecture for this game is so radically different from the architecture of KSP-1. Um, and uh, it, it, it boggles the mind. The difference in scale is hard to wrap your head around. It, it's pretty much the primary technological challenge of the entire project. Is there anything harder? <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Just determining a vehicle's precise position and velocity at an interstellar scale in a way that is also portable to multiplayer, which is always <laughs> like the one that, that bites up, that jumps up and bites you on the bottom. Um, yeah, that's... We, we solved it, but it was a very, very challenging problem to take on. Because I'm assuming you don't just plan the trajectory to get there by just making a maneuver node and just drop, or do, do you? No, it's, that's the thing. So, so you can actually see that we've built out the maneuver system to, to accommodate the, the unique elements of interstellar travel, which is to say, we depict the accelerating portion of a planned trajectory, right? It's actually a different color. You'll see that red line showing the non-impulsive acceleration of the vehicle and then it changes to an elliptical trajectory when, uh, at the fuel out event, right? So essentially the interstellar uh, maneuvering is leveraging exactly the same iconography, it's just that you're pulling the handle so far that the red portion, the non-elliptical portion of your trajectory, extends out of the sphere of influence of your star across the gulf of interstellar space to roughly the point at which you intend to flip your vehicle and burn retrograde for the entire second half of the planned voyage. Still using the same iconography and basic concepts that, that you're using even for a simple flight to the Mun. Simple. Um, but, uh, yeah, but obviously they just like extended to the nth degree. Fair enough. Because um, obviously that's not going to be in the game initially, so for the most part the game's going to be fairly similar to KSP1. So I'm guessing most people buying KSP2 and the Early Access are going to be players of the first game. How easy do you think, if someone's good at KSP1, will they be able to get into KSP2 quite easily, or will there be a bit of a learning curve? There's what? always new stuff. <laughs> uh, one thing that is fun that I didn't see a lot of people getting into in the playtest, but I'm excited to see the reaction to is adding uh, one major new fuel type, which is liquid hydrogen for use in nuclear engines. And when we've been looking at this internally, it completely changes how some types of common interstellar vessels, or interplanetary vessels, sorry, um, work versus yeah. KSP-1. You so guys really screwed my SSD. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm excited to see how you adapt. Oh. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, like, I mean, broadly we have a lot of the same, a lot of the, all the same physics challenges are there. So um, if you know how to solve them in KSP-1, you'll certainly have a leg up. Um, but I, I'm really excited to see, you know, everybody learn new things from our new tutorial systems, our new onboarding, and then take that into, like, out into the Kerbal system at first. And, and KSP-2 is a different game from KSP-1. Um, and one of the interesting challenges I think we're going to be contending with is uh, people who have played a lot of KSP-1 have developed certain muscle memory, right? Certain reflexive habits, hotkeys, things that they're just used to working a certain way. And in some cases, we have determined that there is a usability benefit to changing some of those interactions. So there will probably be a little bit of a learning experience for some people. Anecdotally, it seemed like the experienced players of KSP-1 adapted relatively quickly to whatever changes they came to. Um, I think there's probably going to be, an, uh, that's a good example of a thing we want to continue to have a conversation about over the course of early access because it may just turn out that the community as a whole feels a certain way about a certain function and we're absolutely flexible on that kind of thing. So are we officially allowed, like if we buy Kraken Slayer style merchandise, are, do we have your official permission to wear it on camera? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You right. guys wore it in like your first photo, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> so yeah. I'm. I'm I'm, I'm definitely in the market for a Kraken Slayer hoodie. Just as we were having a <laughs> <laughs> So, um, 
I think some people have like expressed a bit of concern that obviously KSP has been developed for a while, but um, it's now releasing in early access. So what would you say to all the people who are thinking, mm, I don't know about this early access thing, kind of what would you say to reassure them? Well, first of all, we're going to keep our lines of communication wide open so that people understand the state of the build before they spend their money on the game. So uh, take a look at what's in it at any given time and decide yourself if you think you're going to have fun. We have personally determined that the game has crossed the threshold of fun because we cannot stop playing it internally. It's becoming a productivity issue for our team. Um, so uh, we're very confident that it's worth the money now. but. I can't predict what any particular person is going to find the most compelling element of the experience and stuff will keep coming in over the course of early access so it doesn't have everything, have everything you want on day one. Keep following along until you, you see that it has the thing that you want to see in the game. Watch my videos. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming by, Matt. Yeah, my pleasure. Cool. The pleasure was all mine. <laughs> <laughs> I had some of the pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> very pleasurable. <laughs> apart from the last slip up from me, that was good. Great. Uh, I loved it. Those were great questions. Perfect. But there you are. That is my uh, KSP2 developer interviews. I hope you enjoyed and hopefully you gained some insight. Uh, after I conducted that interview, I then spent the day just sort of wandering around Amsterdam. I didn't really know what to do with the, uh, the footage I filmed. So here's a nice little clip I got of this square. And then here's me going to the... Is it the Rijks Museum? The Rix Museum? Probably pronounced it wrong on both of those counts, but I went to that cool little building. Uh, just doing some general sightseeing, because I'm a big fan of the channel, not just bikes. So it was pretty fun walking around Amsterdam and kind of sad looking at how great their uh, bike infrastructure is compared to my countries. And of course, you guys probably know I played Dance Dance Revolution against Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. I'll show you some like clips of that. Hopefully there was no... The audio is not going to get detected by YouTube's copyright system. was pretty fun. I might put, I might, I'll tell you what I might do. I might put the full video of Dance Dance Revolution on my Patreon. There's a little plug for that. And hey, if you want to buy the Kraken Slayer hoodie that featured in this video, you can buy that from the description link below. That's where you also go to join my channel or my Patreon programs. Uh, just like the people scrolling on the left did. They're my Patreons and channel members who help support this content. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this little week of Kerbal Space Program 2 content madness and uh, look forward to playing the game tomorrow i think that's when i'm timing this video to come out so uh yeah hopefully i'm gonna do a live stream or something i'm at work during the day so i mean it'll be like later in the evening gmt so yeah watch out for that and thank you for watching this video and i hope you enjoy the videos to come